Well, happy August 1st, everyone. I'm Catherine Boyle uh, from Key Ministry. I'm normally joined by Beth Golick, my coworker, but Beth is away on vacation this week. So we don't uh, get to enjoy her smiling face. But thank you all for uh, those of you who have joined us today. Um, I, I know for, uh, well, Sylvia and I were having a little conversation before we got going. You know, we're really in those dog days of summer right now. Um, so you may be feeling a little bit of fatigue about all of the ministry stuff that you have accomplished so far this summer. Um, maybe you still have miles to go before it's all done, but we just want to have this opportunity to share, you know, what have you done this summer in your ministries? Uh, you know, what's worked? What has presented some challenges? You know, what kind of questions do you have today? So, um, feel free to just go ahead and, and share, you know, what's going on. Just raise your hand or just start talking and, um, and I'll moderate and make sure that uh, we're not talking over each other. Anybody have something? If you don't, I'm gonna start asking you some questions. So it's not really, um, what we've done so much as I think have begun a slow pivot away from programs. The okay. idea being programs always necessarily put limits on who the program serves, but if the church is called to serve all people, then it's shifting that mentality from a program mentality to a methodology mentality. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really what's been happening this summer. So we haven't done a lot of things, but I think it's been laying the groundwork for a, a lot more ministry in the future in a way that's more organic and adaptable in a way that a program couldn't possibly be so it's a very encouraging move that we've been taking. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we use the word mindset, but it's the same idea. And, and I, I, I personally think that that is super important because it moves away from inclusion, just inclusion to actual belonging. And that's really what we want to be fostering in you know, anything that we're calling a church. So that's fabulous. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else have something they'd like to share? Sure. I mean, okay, I, Patty and then Barb. Oh, um, yes, I'm, I'm Patrick Collins War from Rochester, New York. And um, this last weekend, I was a uh, volunteer chaplain at a summer camp for adults living with developmental disabilities. And my experience uh, that went um, very, very well. We had um, uh, faith a component kind of woven into through everything. Um, I led two kind of uh, two official services, one at the beginning of the week and one at the end of the week, and then uh, devotions um, throughout. And um, I I thought it went well. Um, you know, it's um, I'm always always looking for um additional resources uh to use um so i thought i would bring that question to this group if there are any uh resources that, that you find helpful for um when when leading uh worship or 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 devotions in the summer camp settings anybody have something that's their go-to resources that you'd recommend Well, I know that, you know, there's a lot of churches that you know, are denominational kinds of churches that have like prescribed kinds of, you know, uh, VBS type programming that they use in VBS summer camp, that kind of thing. Is anybody using that sort of thing in their church? And, and you know, what are some pros and cons with that kind of approach? And anything that you would recommend for Patty? Okay, so is nobody using that kind, of, that kind of resources for their summer camps or their, it sounds like nobody is really, that it's, it's on this call anyway. Sylvia, do you have a... Well, we used um, Spark curriculum from Lifeway, I believe it was. Um, and it, it has a prescribed um, format kind of thing with songs and all that kind of stuff that 
is adaptable to whatever once you read through it and everything. Um, what was that? What was the name of that again, Sylvia? Oh, it was. Uh, it's from Lifeway, I believe. I was just looking to see if I had it. But this year, we the curriculum was Sparks. Okay, like S P A R K S. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to remember. You know, my brain is like fog right now because so much has gone on. Um, okay. But yes, it that was the curriculum, and it. Um, it, it gives you the like the prescribed lessons and all those kinds of things that you need. And it has songs that go with each day um, activities, and, you know, and it has special curriculums for individuals with disabilities. And um, I think it goes up to like eighth grade, mm -hmm. but then you can adapt some of the other curriculum. So Patty, question for you. How old yes. were the people that you were serving at the camp? Were they, yeah. were they up, you know, through middle school or high school? Uh, these were actually adults. So they, they were adults. Okay. They were between, I would say between the ages of, of maybe 25 and 55. Okay. So even like with my curriculum for Sunday school, um, and, and we go up through adults. I do the adult class as well. And I just modify because I'm looking at, you know, what the developmental age levels of everybody that's um, there and kind of do a median age range. And we're just flexible in the conversation and the language that you have and the materials that I use for videos and explaining, like yesterday we were talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, and a lot of the, the video activities are either you going to get from the children to um, some that is way above everybody's head. So you have to mix in what is, you know, what you're using and stuff. And my thing is it's more in presentation as opposed to a curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I, I, have, I have found that. Um, certainly as well. Okay. It's, it's helpful to hear. Okay. All right, Barb Stanley had her hand up right after Patty. So what's going on with your ministry, Barb? Well, in the summer, Wonderful Works, we take a break from posting any new resources and we kind of work on getting some resources ready for the fall and whatever initiatives we may be interested in pursuing. And so what's kind of been on our heart this year is looking at denominations and systems for denominations about how do we go to like the actual national leadership of different denominations and find out what, how can they be equipping all their churches better? So this summer I've started doing some interviews with some denominational leaders that um, have disability ministry initiatives already. And we're gathering information to see what has been working, what has been challenging and learning. So I just put a pitch out there. If any of you are on your denomination's disability ministry leadership team or have a contact on yours, I would love to talk to them um, because we're gonna probably be meeting with our denomination in October and maybe some, possibly some other people who are interested like we are finding there are now some leaders in denominations that understand the why disability ministry is needed, but they don't understand how. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of what we're working on. Well, that's exciting to hear that the people you're meeting with are understanding the why, because yeah, once well, they get the why, yeah. then, you know, the inclination is there to, to figure out the how. Yeah, it, it depends. Like that's what we're learning. We're just starting doing these interviews, but I've had one um, denominational, a denominational leader already approach us and, and they know the why and they are asking for the how. And I said, well, before we meet, let me talk to some people and learn. So that's kind of what we're doing. And then I think, so long story short, I'm part of the Church of the Nazarene and um, our national headquarters is 10 minutes away from the uh, church where we're meeting at for Wonderfully Made. So yeah, so Pretty I'm going to. Yeah, so I'm going to that. And so it looks as though we will be meeting with several leaders from our church who seem to understand from what I can gather why 
Um, and I don't think that's every denomination. I have talked to at least one leader that started something in their church and they spent most of the first year trying to convince the why. So it's mm -hmm. not every denomination is there, mm -hmm. but I think we're making progress. And long story short, I feel like I'm with you, Ryan. It's about the changing our mindset. It's not about programming. It is about inclusion. And, and it, this becomes a part of the big church, big C church culture. And I think that starts at the top. And, and so anyway, if anyone's interested in kind of being part of this or has thoughts on it, I would love to talk to you because I think this is really what's been on my heart for next year. We'll see what, what God doors, God opens, but mm, that's what we're doing. Anybody um, have any comments on, or Megan's, I see a hand up. Barb, I was just thinking, and you probably already know this, but sometimes we don't think of things. And I wanted to mention Stephanie Hubach and um, Sandra Peoples could both be real big helps to you right. because yeah, yeah. they do represent their denomination in many things. Awesome. Yeah, I'll reach out to them. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment or question for Barb? That's fantastic, Barb. We'll see how it goes, but I just feel like, I feel like that this year, I just feel like we're in a new era of disability ministry in the church. I feel like it's going to start catching on, honestly, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our culture is already there, so it's not as much of a leap for the church to make. Right. I'll say the, the one barrier with people asking how is a lot of times the how that they're asking is they're looking for disability ministry in a box or for a plug and play option. So right. even if you get them to the why, there's still that like other barrier to turn. Um, I guess, I don't know, people hear disability and they kick it into an entirely separate category from all other kinds of ministry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd like to say it's good to get denominational leaders talking about it and thinking about it because that is, yeah, how culture changes is top down. Yeah, and I think I agree with you, Ryan. I think we have to approach the conversation as not a plug and play because disability ministry is never going to be the same at any church. It's more of like creating a system of what questions do they ask and where do they go for resources. And one of the things that we have found just starting to talk to people is it's really about getting buy in at the local level. So you want to have like a structure at the top, but it needs to have the buy in at the district level or the you know local because the culture is different in different parts of the country too. Um, so it's a really complex. And I think that's why maybe a lot of churches haven't even started talking about it, but that's kind of what's been on my heart and getting me fired up this summer. So we'll see what happens. Well, Barb, Sylvia said that she's interested in joining the conversation. Oh, so great. I just want to make sure you see that. Awesome. Yeah, I will definitely be uh, contacting you. Thank you, Sylvia. Well, I just want to throw something out here. Um, some of you know that um, in my church, we, we actually have been without a senior pastor for quite some time. And we actually called a new senior pastor yesterday and I am just beyond excited. Um, but part of what is really exciting is that in his sermon yesterday, before we officially issued the call, he mentioned ministering to and with people of all abilities. And so I have no idea really, you know, like what his exposure is um, to the disability world, but, you know, my, my ears were attuned to all kinds of things he was saying, and that was a big one that stood out for me. So, you know, when, and, and he comes from a different part of the country than where I am. So, you know, that says to me that, you know, there is definitely penetration down to the church level of a lot of this kind of stuff that maybe we're not seeing you know, like in our face all the time, but that the conversations are happening. And so um, the work that we're doing is, is definitely getting through at some level. So hopefully you're encouraged by that. So what else, uh, what else do you have? You know, what challenges, what great news, you know, what um, anybody reports from VBS or, or other reports from summer camps that they'd like to share? Is everybody through all of their summer programming at this point? No, okay. I just Rachel. Want to know. We're... Rachel and then oh, Abby. Yeah, Rachel first and then Abby, if you don't mind. 
So I um, just kind of wanted to share, like, uh, I guess, an encouraging, I'll probably cry because I'm still really just moved by the whole experience. So we go, uh, we take kids, our, our uh, typical kids to summer camp, and it's like a week-long camp. So we take our first and second graders one week, and then third, fourth, and fifth grade, and then middle school, then high school. And this year we had a, a child who moved from our children's ministry to our uh, youth ministry. So she graduated fifth grade. So she's going into middle school and she does have a physical, a, a pretty significant physical disability. She has arthrogryposis multiplex congenital. And she's grown up in our church since she was a baby. And uh, she uses her mouth for everything. She really doesn't have a lot of use um, for her arms and legs. And so she can kind of get around in a walker and, and the use of a wheelchair. But she asked her mom when we were talking about summer camp, she said, I want to go. And her mom's like, you know, I just don't think, you know, her mom's never let her go anywhere before. Mm -hmm. And so her, you know, mom is a good friend of mine and, and called. And so, you know, she's kind of interested in going. I said, well, we'll, let's, let's just try it. Let's just, you know, so I called the, the place that hosts the camp and, and explained the situation. I said, you know, I, along with another um, volunteer would be willing to come just, you know, to kind of meet all of her needs because she needs help with everything. I mean, bathing, toileting, everything, you know, um, is really, really hands-on. And so, uh, and they were so gracious and like just saying, absolutely. Cause I didn't know a lot of times, I mean, I've been in that situation for a while. I don't really know. And you can kind of hear it in their voice and, and I didn't, and they just were so open to the experience. And so we took Paige and it was just an awesome week. And it's so awesome to, to see people starting and, and to just, see the need and just uh, wrap their arms around her. And it's tough because it's middle school. And so we, the first, um, and it's very clear that she has a physical disability. Cognitively, girlfriend is like smarter than me, you know? <laughs> um, but people don't, people assume that there's a cognitive disability a lot of times when there's a, a significant physical disability. And so the first day or two, people were kind of not rudely staring, but just kind of watching, didn't really know, weren't really engaging with her. Um, but as the week went on and people just got to know her and it just, just to see them open up and wrap their arms around her. And, and everybody there was like, whatever Paige wants to do, they have this like huge water slide. That's like, you have to climb up a couple of stories to go down and they're like, we'll help get her up there. And so um, there were like two or three like men, you know, helping to get her up on top. And then, and in order to even get her down the slide, like I had to lay there and she had to like lay on top of me with my arms and my legs like around her so that, because she can't really control her limbs. And so if her arm or her leg went out, you know, she could have gotten hurt. And so we're just, and we went down this crazy water slide and, and just all of those things. And it turned out on Thursday of that week actually is our throw guide post day, AMC day. And um, the conference goes on. Um, and it was going on that week and her parents chose to let her come to camp. And her mom wrote this big, long post um, afterwards that she just said, you know, it's a lot because I've never let my kid go anywhere, anywhere, ever. She's never been away from us. And she was um, away from us for the first time. And it was on Arthur God post this day. And so the thing was, you're supposed to wear blue. That's Arthur God post this color. And so we asked the people at camp, we're like, hey, if you happen to have blue, you know, want to wear it tomorrow, we're just going to kind of show support for Paige. Well, a lot of people who had blue wore it, a lot of people didn't. And so what the camp did, they went out and bought rolls of blue duct tape so that everybody could like put a strip of like blue just so that they could like wear their blue. And so like the whole day, I'm just like bawling my eyes out. And it was just a, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience because it's just you see the culture starting to change and you see people starting to just, who've never had an experience like that or an experience with somebody with a you know disability, just welcome it. So it was very, very encouraging and it just made my entire summer. I was very exhausted by the end of it because Paige is about as tall as I am. Like we're about the same size. And so physically it just, you know, it was a long week, but it was fantastic. So. That is a phenomenal story. 
That's awesome. I hope that that's an encouragement to everybody that's here and anybody who's going to be watching this video too. What we're doing matters and it's getting through. Well, it looks like we lost Abby. Um, so hopefully she'll be jumping back on in a minute. Does anybody else have something, uh, a wonderful success story or a question or a challenge? Either one. Meekins. There. I'm working with Tom's computer and it doesn't like me. So I finally <laughs> got in here. Um, I was just thinking that one of the things, the burdens on my heart, and I mean that in a positive way, is discipleship and teaching others. I mean, we hear all the time, don't do ministry alone. That's very important. And we don't. But um, how do we pass on what we're doing to the, the, whether it's the next generation or whatever? How, what are your best practices? for finding those people. And then, because we've tried a couple of times and then they just kind of drift away. And so we're like, mm -hmm. what did we do wrong? <laughs> and I don't know that we did anything wrong. I think life circumstances just changed it in whatever. But if you guys have any suggestions for us, we're always looking for, okay, how do we find those people? Of course, prayer is one of the most foremost things we need to do. And then, and then, you know, what kinds of things do you think about when you're training somebody to come after you? Excellent question. I think it probably depends on what you do. One of the, I was recently helping a, a church leader who was transitioning out after 20 plus years of doing the disability ministry at her church. And she was overwhelmed by the idea of, I can't find anyone to replace me. So one of the things I had her do was just, I said, talk out. January 1st to December 31st, what do you do all year? And I wrote down every single thing she said, and then we kind of categorized it afterwards. And what we found was there were very few things that were actually specifically disability on that list. And the lion's share of it was administrative stuff and like graphics designing and so many normal things that I said, if you could actually break this out and realize the role the roles that exist that you might be wearing multiple hats, you can put those hats on different people and then it's not quite so overwhelming to find that unicorn who can do all things because nobody's gifted in every single way. So actually just sitting down and breaking out, what do you do allows you to train people up in those specific areas, I think. Excellent uh, idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. This is actually what I spoke on at the key ministry conference. And um, we missed it. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> so before I uh, did wonderful works and I worked for my church, part of my job was ministry mobilization. And so that would be people in the church who wanted to start a ministry would come. And it was my job to vet their idea and see yes or no. And if I said yes, then I had to help get them mobilized. And so I've learned a lot about what, um, what works and what doesn't. And some of it is in the vetting process when you're looking for people. Um, there's kind of some tells as you're getting to know them that this person is going to stick or this person is not. And then part of that also is exactly, exactly what Ryan just said. It's understanding what is the competency, what is the roles you need, what are the competencies, and to know that it's not going to be one person. Almost never is it going to be one person. It's going to be a team of people, and they each go into their place where they are passionate. And then there are some things that, um, that a lot of churches don't do that cause people to fall away, that are a lot of it is communication or um thinking let's like people I think a lot of churches sometimes mobilize someone then they just let them go and think they're fine but most people they have to have that continuous support so if you want I can share you my I can share my presentation with you I can send it to you so um yeah I mean it's hard no matter what it's never perfect but there are just some things that might make it easier I wanted to comment on one of the things you said Barb one of the the key distinctions that like I'll make when I'm talking with people is telling the difference between churches that are permissive and supportive. Um, Cause there's a really big difference of yeah. a lot of people will come say, Oh, I want to do a disability minister in my church. Yeah. And the church says, you know, go forth, here's yeah. some money, here's some space, go, go do it over there. But that's a, a far cry from a supportive church. So figuring out how yeah. do you actually have your leadership, Tom and Julie support you and have them take ownership for it so that they are the ones who, are responsible ultimately for the success. And then it's about equipping and empowering the ministry rather than just allowing you guys to, you know, do what you want and <laughs> figure it out. But that's a, that was a, a, a crucial, I think, distinction to recognize the difference between permissiveness and supportiveness. 
and doing things to encourage supportiveness. Yeah, yeah, um, Ryan. Let me let me just interject there. That that's excellent because what happens? It, it, we're finding that if it's if it's a person centered, if it's gifts that a person is having that's making it go, then it's hard to find the exact person to fill that role. Um, but I, I, I like what you say. Thank you. Thanks. One of, real quick, one of the key things I think that makes a difference is when um, you say someone is going to start a new ministry, they have to have a point, a point person on the staff that is accountable for them. Because I think another big mistake that happens in churches is they're like, okay, go do it. And then there's not that one person who owns it. If you do not have a staff person who owns that, it will fall through the cracks. So that's a big one too. Yeah, yeah, and from the top, I've noticed if the pastor has a child with a disability, the church tends to ra uh, rally around them. When that pastor leaves, things get a little uh, different. So, uh, yeah, the, the top is very, very important to uh, to have on board. That's the last thing I'll say on it, but it's not even just about disability ministry. It's not about the disability part. The reason a lot of these ministries don't last is because the churches don't understand ministry mobilization. So they really can't onboard any ministry. And so we really also need to be training staff. How do you support ministry leaders regardless of the ministry? The reason some ministries stay longer than disability ministries because disability ministry is actually harder, is a harder ministry. But it's the... There's just some key components to ministry mobilization that that are helpful across the board. So it's definitely doable, but we have a, a learning curve, I think, on how to do it. Yeah, Barb, <clears throat> a couple. Of, um, thank you, Ryan, for sharing uh, presentation or blog post um, blog post from Johnny and friends on how to structure your disability ministry. And Barb, if you don't mind dropping that presentation in the chat, that would be great. Um, and we can put both of those in our show notes uh, for the video after um, we're finished today. So uh, fabulous, uh, fabulous discussion. And, um, you know, I really love that idea of having that point person on staff, Barb, who will, you know, kind of oversee or shepherd, you know, have some kind of responsibility for that new ministry that's coming along. And I, I think that that gets to, you know, that, that's very much a permissive versus supportive issue as well. So thank you all for that really excellent discussion. So what else is going on? Um, are, you, are you planning for fall now? Are you, um, you know, yeah, see some heads nodding on that. Do you have any, any challenges this year that you're dealing with that maybe are new or something that would be helpful to share with this group? Al. Sorry, I'm late. I had to pull into McDonald's uh, to get Wi-Fi. I'm on the road back home. Um, the last week I've been doing some research on um, <clears throat> projects for people that are aging out of services like the 20 college age, things like that. Um, I was very encouraged. I got to visit four different ones, um, two in Holland, Michigan, one's called Benjamin's Hope. Another one is uh, uh, the seminary, um, Western Seminary. They have friendship houses there where they have seminarians with abilities, um, typical abilities and disabilities together, as well as a master's in um, disability ministry now at Western Seminary. So it's really good. I got to meet with a professor with a disability that teaches in their program. Looks really good. I also visited. Um, University in Illinois, and they've started a program a few years ago uh, called RISE, where they have um, college age students that are part of the campus. They take courses and also learn independence. Um, and uh, I hope with my organization to have some interns with that. But that's a really good program if you have um, some high functioning. I know um, Tom and Julie, we met someone from your church that's going to Shepherds, I think, um, in the in the fall. And uh, also, um, um, yeah, Shepherds College, I'm sorry, I got that mixed up, in Wisconsin. Um, they have, it's a college, basically, three-year training in horticulture, cuisine, and uh, technology uh, in-house. But 
I was very encouraged that there are possibilities for the 20 somethings um, for training and vocate uh, jobs and things like that that are happening now. Oops. Uh, you had a, you had a lot of background sound there um, in your location. That's okay, totally fine. Um, I'm sure that this is something that you know that you all think about. You know that the kinds of resources that Al was just mentioning um, is this something that you see? Um, you know, are, are are parents asking that sort of thing more at you know this time of year? You know, because it is the school time and it's kind of the natural time to be thinking about that sort of thing. I'm seeing a lot of heads nod yes. Any any other comments or uh, resources that you would recommend to the group? Okay, um, so Barb, yes, uh, let's see. We should be able to share, but you know what? If not, then I will definitely add, um, you know, add a link in the show notes. So, uh, I'm not really sure how to do an upload, Barb, but um, you know, give it your best shot, and we'll we'll make sure that that everybody on you know on this you know has a way to um, to get this link. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I I don't hate to channel my mother, but I have no idea about technology, and I don't <laughs> I don't know how to get the the PDF file has really the more details in the slideshow, so I want to right. sit with that. So I'll try my best, and if not, I'll send it to you, Catherine, and you can figure okay. out how to get it. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay. So what else is going on? Does anybody have staff turnover that you're dealing with? Is that a is that an issue? Okay, you've got a couple of nods there. Um, is that impacting your summer? Is that impacting your fall? Heather's, do you want to talk about something? Saw you say something, but you're on mute. I'm trying to unmute you. There you go. Oops. Okay, Heather, we can't hear you, or I can't hear you at all. Can you try again? Okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? So um, with Key Ministries partnership with Tim Tebow Foundation, like it's a big deal for us that like Night to Shine is back, like officially in person this coming yes. year. So we're getting ready to like kick off, like planning for that next month. And so that's a and big. If you, if you guys don't know, Rachel hosts, do you guys host the biggest one? So I don't know the like stats for the biggest, but the last like in-person one we held in 2020, um, we had close to 5,000 people in total. So about 1,200 guests with special needs um, and then a lot of other people. <laughs> so um, I'm sure that this one won't be that big. You know, we still have a lot of hesitation um, even in Florida, but, uh, but we're really excited just to start somewhere. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, Sylvia didn't have maybe that meant, I don't know how, what your stats are, Sylvia, if you guys even do Night to Shine, but you had how many in your VBS this year? Well, and it was we, yeah, we do Night to Shine. Okay. Um, but in VBS, not total special needs. We had um, nine special needs kids. Five of them were in person and three of them were virtual. Um, one in Louisiana because we do international. Um, but total VBS was probably about six or 800 kids and adults. Um, <laughs> it's kids all over the place is all I can say. Um, but I stay in my room with my kids so we stay safe. <laughs> Oh, that sounds like a good strategy. That's a lot of bodies. <laughs> so, so what, what else is on your mind today? Uh, a couple of you nodded when I said something about staff turnover, volunteer turnover. Is there anything you'd like to talk about with regard to either of those? And it both can be as impactful to your ministry as, you know, if it's a, a key volunteer or volunteers versus a staff person. Yes, I, I would speak to that um, a little bit. 
Um, I work with a, I'm a chaplain within a, um, a group home agency. And so staff turnover for direct support personnel is always something we're, 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 we're working with. And so always constantly going out into the uh, Rochester community to um, job fairs provide, providing incentives for folks. Um, we're paying, I think, $17 an hour um, for employees um, to come work with us. But it's um, always a, a challenge to, to find um, the best help for both uh, both in residential settings and day programs. We also have um, some incentives for people who have been with us for a long time, especially through COVID, um, through New York State, um, have been providing some additional monies. So that's been helpful. Patty, I'm just curious, do you, do you all recruit, um, like do you do recruiting directly like to seminaries, for example, or for um, or to like um, special ed teachers or retired special ed teachers? I'm just sort of curious, like, you know, how people get connected to your organization, you know, and what, what their background tends to be. That's a great, a great question. I found for the, the most part, um, for our direct support personnel, um, Mostly from the just from the Rochester community, and we do a lot of uh, on the on the job training um, for caring for individuals. Um, many people um, you know have a lot of the caring, compassionate um, uh, skills um, already, so that's that's helpful. Um, as far as our spiritual care team, uh, of which I'm part, um, I'm. Uh, very impressed um, that there are five full-time chaplains uh, within the agency. Um, we cover all of um, all of the Rochester area and Buffalo as well, so it's quite a large agency. Um, but to have five full-time uh, spiritual care folks uh, is is a wonderful commitment. Um, and um, as far as uh, qualifications for the spiritual care pieces. Um, Certainly are, are looking for folks who are interested in and certainly have a strong faith background um, and as much seminary or, or, or theological education as, as possible. Thank you. That's really excellent. So um, I'm going to send Barb's presentation to each of you, you know, by email after we get through this. So, um, and we'll make sure that we get it posted. And like I said, in the show notes on a shareable link. So um, just FYI. So what else is going on? Does anybody have anything that you have specifically planned for August? Or is, is it getting to be too close to back to school for some of you? Yeah, I'm getting some nodded heads. Okay. So um, yeah, go ahead, Julie. We're, we're getting excited about um, starting up Zoom calls for parents and ministry workers alike. Um, once a month, we're going to start that in the month of August, which is the month of August now, it's right? <laughs> it's August. Already it's August. So um, just wanted to put that word out um, to be looking for that on our Champions for Parents community page. If you're not a part of that, we would love to have you join us. Um, and then just because I think parents and ministry workers need to be together and really building that community together. This is wonderful. We are so blessed by Key Ministries Roundtables. And it just sparked an idea for us. And this is, um, you know, we don't know if anybody will ever come, but, you know, you have to start something to know. <laughs> so you, you start it. I remember Ryan Wolf saying one time, yeah, you throw it out into the void and see if anything happens. <laughs> and we're all there, right? Whenever we have to, whenever we think of some new ideas. So we're pretty excited about that though, because I think if both, um, both mentalities, both emotion sets, you know, come to the table together, it could really make a huge difference in furthering the disability community working with each other. So we're pretty excited about that. That's our new thing that's coming up starting in August. We'll, we've got Zoom calls scheduled from August through December, and then we'll see. 
what happens after that? What uh, what date are you guys doing the first one this month? The third. Should we write it on the calendar? Let me look real quick. Quick, quick, quick. It is. <laughs> We're gonna put it in our newsletter, so we could give it to you in our newsletter. I don't. Ready to put you on the spot. It. Yeah. No, it's okay. Usually I put it on the calendar, but I don't think I got it there yet. So um, we will let y'all know. Okay. Okay. Well, and if again, if you aren't already. Um, following Tom and Julie's page champion for parents champions for parents on Facebook definitely do that and you'll get the notifications of um, these and all the other um, zoom discussions that they plan to have through the rest of the year so excellent well and 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 bringing that up leads to another excellent point that that is probably um, maybe not top of mind for everybody here but um, you know, it's probably a time when a lot of folks working in ministry are kind of tired. So are any of you doing anything to refresh and, and rejuvenate between now and either the start of your new you know, ministry year, you know, the end of the summer for your family, you know, what have you before back to school? You know, is there anything that you'd like to share that might be helpful for others who, um, you know, are in this community of ministry leaders um, to help them get a little refreshing too. Anybody got some, anything wonderful that they're doing to get refreshed? My hands up, I'll put it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but as we were having that conversation before um, we opened, um, August is slow down month for our church period which is so refreshing. I need every second of it. Um, and it doesn't mean that church stops. We'd still have regular church services, but ministries kind of stop um, in terms of having meetings every week or month or whatever, we, how, however you schedule your meetings. Um, but it, it is a, a plan, a time of planning and refreshing. And as I said, I, um, my husband and I will be traveling to, Tennessee um, to visit the family in Tennessee with the seven grandchildren. So I'm not real sure it's going to be a time of rest and relaxation, um, but it'll be a time of gathering with the family. The two oldest um, will be, um, there's a cotillion. Um, so they will be honored um, on Saturday. But the, the, the whole thing that Ryan and even Barb were talking about in terms of the ministry, we are, I don't want to say backing away, but pulling away from some of the connections that we have with um, outside ministries to go more inside. Um, like we won't be partnering with um, Buddy Break, Nathaniel's Hope. And we won't be doing the official night to shine because I'm feeling a need for us to become less programmatic inclusively and do belonging where we are supporting the needs of the individuals who want the support as opposed to saying, this is what we have to offer and this is what you have to do. We want them to, to guide the decisions about what is happening with them. And we want to be more intentional about supporting the needs of the individuals that we have in our communities. So what we will be doing instead of um, buddy break, we will be doing a respite, rest, and restoration um, adventure. Um, and it will be meeting instead of once a month, it'll be meeting twice a month with um, a division between the, the eight, some age groups. We will have a children's age group and a more youth and young adult, adult group where the children will be doing more activities. Um, and uh, learning certain skills and the older age groups will be doing more life skills where they will be doing cooking activities and reading groups and art crafty kinds of things where they're looking at entrepreneurship and all of those kinds of activities. 
Um, and with the Night to Shine, we will be doing an, um, an evening of something. I can't remember what that actually is. Um, and it won't be in February um, because we wanted to um, allow them the opportunity. It will be like a March event kind of activity, which is not a prom event and not a Valentine's Day event. It would be in between there where they get to plan the activities that they want to do and an evening of elegance. And they will still dress up and they will be the designers of the event. Um, so that's what we are moving towards and our planning activities will be done this month. Excellent. But we will, we will do partnerships with, uh, um, Patty was talking about group homes and stuff and uh, we're purposing to reach out more to group homes and activities where they can be involved. I know you're not quite <clears throat> to where I'm, what I'm going to say next, but you know one thing that we talk about internally at Key Ministry is basically working ourselves out of a job, and so I think that you know that's that's kind of what you're talking about in a way because you're you're getting the whole church to look at the community-based needs instead of just relying on these outside organizations to come in and and put that box of solutions or ideas in front of your, you know, your church for one day a year or, or whatever it is. I mean, it really is kind of the next step. Right. And since I'm a volunteer, I say they can't fire me anyway for whatever it is. Right. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. Catherine, I love that. I'd add on to what Sylvia was just saying there. And sorry, guys, I'm late. I was just got out of another meeting, but our church in Delaware, we have actually kind of, we've bowed out of Night to Shine as well. Um, not for anything to do with Night to Shine, but in Delaware in February, we've had a couple of challenges. Two years ago, we had a snowstorm that almost ruined our event. And obviously we were virtual. Um, and then this year, kind of the same thing. And um, so we were actually moving ours out to May or June in Delaware. We are creating um, kind of what Sylvia said, a prom experience basically, but not to sh not taking Night to Shine because of the winter element. So um, we're excited to do that. And kind of what Sylvia was saying is a lot of what God is putting on my heart as the lead of this ministry is we really want to focus everything on servicing those that we serve and versus just having our doors open to anybody that can kind of come in that we never have an experience with them. I know it's planting a seed and hopefully God will grow that seed, but really our adult ministry and our young adult ministry is growing um, naturally. And we want to focus all of our energy and making their experience ex exceptional, God focused and that, that they can spread that word alone versus just opening the doors for a one day event for 150 people, and then really not having an opportunity to minister them after that. So, um, but the winter element was the main focus, but the secondary is what God's really put in my heart. What Sylvia just mentioned is going away from them, take, controlling the event and allowing us to be able to minister to, the, to our families. Um, so I love to hear, I love hearing Sylvia's in that same mindset because it is powerful when you, when you have that opportunity to really pour all of your energy into those that you're serving now versus just a little bit of a sprinkle, um, what Night to Shine does for us. Another thing I wanted to share with you guys, um, my downtime, I just got back from the beach. So in Delaware, we're close to the Jersey Shore. So I got to hang out for the beach for a week. Um, but in this ministry, God has a tendency to always show the why. So no matter how stressed I get, or no matter how I'm like, I can't do this, this is just frustrating right now. I will be in there in one event and I'll give you a very simple example of what I mean. Uh, we had a group home that showed up for one of our monthly dances that we host and uh, never saw this kid before. And as I was talking to him, just kind of meeting him and stuff, my cross was dangling in front of me. And again, never met him before. And he simply points to my cross and goes, Jesus. And I said, yes, but that Jesus loves you and don't ever forget that. And that was kind of in the same moment that I was just going through the motions, but it's like God just said, here is your why. Your why is right here. Bring me to him. And so when I get stressed or when I get tired, it's so funny that God knows that and that in our next event, he will drop a why for me. And it's almost like it just pours that away, takes that burden off my shoulders. And I'm like, all right, God, let's go. So I would encourage you to look for that why in everything, because if your eyes are open, he will show you your why and kind of help take that stress away from you. And then the last thing I wanted to share is something awesome that we just did yesterday. So our church, um, the journey in Newark, Delaware, 
every year we host what we call Love Week. It's basically a week, a week that our church goes outside the walls and serves the community. We get about a thousand people that go outside, serving various aspects of the community. And this year, for the first time, our special needs ministry, because we've been growing over the past couple of years, we have our own couple of events going on. And yesterday we partnered with a, I have to look at the name because I get it wrong, Artworks for All, All, sorry. An artist came in and basically what they did is they're building a 12 foot by eight foot mural. And so we had a serving opportunity where we had 32 of our young adults come in and they painted 16 different sections of this mural that an artist is then going to then compose and create this 12 foot by eight foot mural, which we are going to hang inside the journey and be dedicated towards this ministry inside of our special needs room. Um, so it's very powerful to be a part of it. I'll share some pictures with you guys from, from yesterday. So we had our young adults painting their own concept and whatever God told them to, to color into this beautiful mural that's going to be dedicated inside of our rooms that we serve them during our church. So it was a great serving opportunity done by our special needs ministry with our with our own journey members partnering alongside of them to help them paint and kind of be it's just powerful i'm still on a high from it so it was just it's going to be a really cool concept and at the journey we just launched literally last weekend a teen room um, inside of our journey so now we're serving kids teens and we have a very active adult ministry as well so I could ramble on and on because God does that to me with this ministry, but that's just some encouragement for you, especially when you get burnt out and tired, look for your why. And for me, that's when I get to that frustrated moment, God has a perfect moment to just say, here's your why, get refreshed, let's go. So that's my two cents. Thank you so much, Wayne. That was fabulous. Rachel. I'll just piggyback off that a little bit. You know, the why is so, it's so important because, um, because this ministry is relentless, you know, and no matter what ministry you're in, um, but special needs, uh, you know, definitely to another extent, I think, but, um, and we're going through a season, like we've had our administrative director uh, for, because, so we started with uh, Night to Shine several years ago. And then out of that, we actually started a nonprofit because we didn't want it to just be like, one night a year that we saw them we really wanted to like extend that and our church had a special needs ministry but we really just wanted to go beyond that and so we have a nonprofit um that does a lot of programs it actually has a day program and so like our administrative director for the day program um is leaving and so like that's a huge thing you know finding somebody with those um skills and talents and passion and everything it's you know it's super stressful but um but it's been awesome because the the participants who attend our day program, a lot of them don't attend our church. That's, you know, just where they go during the day. Um, but of course it is still a faith-based organization and they talk about Jesus and then they, you know, have these conversations. And so somehow something about baptism came up. And so they said, well, you know, our church is going to be doing baptism soon. And so there was a young man who really wanted to get baptized. And so he asked his parents and they said, yes. And so I think that day, that Sunday, half the church was invited by him. Like everywhere he went for like a month beforehand, he was like, I'm getting baptized. You know, you should come. And he was just telling everybody. And um, it was the funniest thing because <laughs> we were down in the, um, the baptismal, uh, the lead pastor and myself, and we're waiting for him. He was the last one. And we're, so we're waiting for him to kind of come up the stairs and like around the corner. When he comes around the corner, we realize he just has his uh, swim trunks on and no shirt. Like, <laughs> so that's the first time we we're like, oh, okay. All right. So he comes down and just, it was such an incredible um, experience. And so those are the things it's like, it's just, it, it is the why. And it's what kind of keeps you going when you don't know <laughs> how you're going to, you know, how you're going to keep going. Um, it definitely does that. So super cool experiences. That's wonderful. Yeah. My, uh, my former pastor used to talk about water country USA because our, our church had like where the baptismal was, there was definitely a splash zone in our old building uh, where people would actually sit. So, um, so, but you know, I, I mean, it's just, it, I mean, God has a smile on his face when we're doing things like that. So there's no reason that we can't, you know, enjoy every aspect of, of uh, a baptism, especially when it's so joyful. So, um, well, I want to make sure that we have five minutes, guys. Um, and so this has been a fabulous discussion. Julie, I'll get to you in one quick second, but um, Al has put some information in the chat about some of the places that he got to visit this year. So I encourage you to look 
there um, for information about Shepherd's College, Western Seminary, uh, Judson University. And then he also mentions that there's several churches in Michigan and New Jersey that are doing Kings and Queens events in the summertime. So it sounds kind of like night to shine, but you know, under the church's authority. So quickly, Julie, what do you have? And then you're the last comment and then we'll wrap up. Okay. So I just wanted to say you, you had asked the question earlier about what are you doing to refresh, you know, or to get ready, to get yourself ready. And I would want to say thank you, Key Ministry, Catherine, thank you and Beth and, and Steve for these roundtables, because really, honestly, this is a shot in the arm every single time that we come and then we get all excited about ministry again, because you guys are, you are our heroes because you work so hard at what you do and you don't stop. You just keep going and going, you know, from the early days of the pandemic and trying to figure out how the heck are we going to do ministry now, you know, with all of these shutdowns and we did it, you know, and you guys um, really helped us along because we were newbies. And I just, I just want you to know that we really appreciate what you do at key ministry. Well, thank you. I, I, um, you know, I, that means an awful lot. So, um, you know, and on behalf of Beth and Steve, and, and we have a, another person now on our team to, um, you know, just thank you for expressing your gratitude. Um, I mean, we love what we do, you know, I mean, that's, we're all here because we love what we do in some way. And, you know, all of this has a, a personal connection. Um, Allison, really quick. I just want to say again, um, thank you for the blogs, the new blogs you're doing. They're great. Thank you. Really thank appreciate you. it. Well, and if you guys didn't have a chance to join us last week, you know, we are starting this new project because we know, I mean, none of us are getting any younger here, right? And, you know, God is raising up new people behind each of us. And some of them are already working in your ministries, but many of them aren't. But they probably are having life experiences and passions like most of us did before we got into this kind of ministry. And so the Meekins helped kick off a series that we're doing in webinars and blog posts, et cetera, about helping other people find their ministry purpose. Um, because you know, if somebody has that passion, it can be really hard to figure out what that is. But seeing other people's experiences can help shorten that process for others. So we started with the Meekins last week. It was a great discussion. I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and check that out. Um, we'll be having more of these webinars coming up. Um, you know, definitely sign up for our, this month's disability ministry video roundtable. It's titled Potty Talk. We are actually going to be talking about policies and procedures around toileting. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that's going on where churches are starting to, you know, build adult size changing tables and really understand that, you know, if they're going to be serious about providing disability ministry and supports, then that is absolutely a part of it. Um, our next idea share is going to be Monday, October 3rd. We're, we've gone to every other month now. Um, and then we do have other things that are in the works but are not yet on our events page. So do check back there often. And, um, and just, you know, we hope to see you on some of our future events. So thank you everybody so much for this great discussion today. And we look forward to seeing you at another key ministry event soon. Thanks so much.